Okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Ross Bagertis. Uh, I am a, uh, a network engineer and IT trainer. I've been spent my whole career doing this. My background is actually in structural engineering. That's what my degree is in. But uh, I switched to IT in the mid 90s and have been doing it and loving it ever since. So it's really my pleasure to be here. And I, I hope you all can get something out of this. So uh, let's uh, let's start by uh, introducing this, uh, visualizing TLS encryption here. The whole reason that I started uh, working on this a couple of years ago was because I wanted to learn more about what was happening with encryption. And every time I went out onto the internet to learn more about how TLS works and how encryption works, I got a lot of bad information. And the bad information would say things like, uh, oh, the public key is used to encrypt the data and the private key is used to decrypt the data. And that's kind of true in some circumstances. Uh, otherwise, it would just have information that was really designed for a computer scientist with a mathematics background to understand how the encryption was working. Or it was oversimplified to the point that it wasn't useful when I was trying to use Wireshark. So that's the whole reason why I started this. And I've really been enjoying learning more and more about TLS and encryption and decrypting messages in Wireshark. So let's get started and talk about what we're going to do here. All right, slides not advancing here. Let's try this again. There we go. All right, so our the topics for the session. First, I want to talk about SSL versus TLS and find out the difference there. There's a whole multitude of information about that that's incorrect out on the internet, where SSL does thing Y and TLS does thing X, and those are just not true. So we'll look at how those terms came to be. We'll talk about encrypting data and what's required to do that, especially with web browsers. We'll talk about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. I think the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is really, really nifty because the mathematics are really accessible to pretty much anybody who has had some basic math classes. You can really understand what's happening there, and it's, it's pretty cool. We'll also talk about the elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We'll talk about the data encryption protocols used in TLS, and then we'll actually go into Wireshark. I'll show you how to capture session keys input them into Wireshark to get the information uh, that you're looking for in Wireshark out. So to, to really be clear, this is a beginning level class. Uh, it's intended for engineers who maybe don't have a computer science background, don't have a background in mathematics, to be able to really visualize what's happening enough so that you can use it to help yourself troubleshoot and analyze stuff in Wireshark. So. Uh, I have uh, this, this URL that I posted in the chat that uh, Graham, Graham has posted here as well. Uh, that URL, uh, that contains a couple pieces of information, a link to the, my OneNote page here, uh, has access to my Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter. You can access my email if you have a private question you'd like to send me. Uh, you can see my courses that I publish at Pluralsight. That's my main job is I make content as an independent contractor for Pluralsight. And uh, you can go on Pluralsight's website. I teach the CompTIA Network Plus certification. I also teach the Cisco Certified Network Associate courses. There's over 65 hours, over 75 hours of courses there uh, that you can take a look at if you're interested. I also have some courses in the Wireshark learning path at Pluralsight. Uh, and I am very proud to share that space with Chris Greer and Betty Dubois, who hopefully you've heard speak at the, the conference so far. Um, really great courses there. If anybody is interested in a 30-day trial for Pluralsight All Access Pass, just shoot me an email and I'd gladly get you that 30-day All Access Pass. You can take a look at the Wireshark content or if you're interested in other networking stuff. Uh, other information in here, I uh, have some links to this TLS Illustrated website. Uh, if you're just getting started or you're an experienced user of TLS and want to learn more, um, uh, you, can, uh, you can take a look at the link here. 
So somebody's asking what the email is. It's it's right here in my OneNote link, bagertis at outlook.com. Just shoot me an email. Um, again, the TLS Illustrated, uh, this user, uh, Xargs, not bombs, uh, built this, this TLS Illustrated site. It is outstanding. I am not going to go through all the details of this, but I highly recommend doing it after uh, this presentation, it'll give you all the stuff you need to be successful looking at this. You can click into each one of these, the client hello. It has annotations of exactly what each part of this handshake is doing in TLS. And he's outlined it for both TLS 1.2 and 1.3. Really cool stuff. Uh, and then last, there's a link to the packet captures here. Uh, it's just a Dropbox links. I have two captures there, one for TLS 1.2 with the decryption key and one for TLS 1.3. So those are my links. Uh, let's, let's move on here. Okay, so let's start with web browser encryption. What is required for web browser encryption? encryption here. So uh, there's two components that I that I list for web browser encryption. First, we need to negotiate the encrypted session. And that's going to be involved choosing protocols and keys in order to do the encryption. And then there's the encryption protocols themselves, which we're going to use to actually do the bulk encryption of data. So to negotiate the encryption session, we're either going to use SSL, which is secure socket layer, or transport layer security, TLS. We're going to find out the difference between these two in a little bit when I do a history lesson about these. But for now, we're going to use one of those two protocols in order, to, in order to negotiate our session. And then those sessions are going to negotiate which encryption protocols we use, which could be on the key exchange side, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, or elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, ECDHE. And then we can use the bulk encryption protocols, triple DES, AES, or ChaCha20. So when we're doing web browser encryption, we're going to use TLS or SSL to negotiate the session. And we're going to use one of these protocols below here to actually do the encryption of the data. So a quick history lesson here. Uh, back in 1994, the first web browser came out, right? This is right at the advent of HTTP. And Netscape Navigator, developed at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, uh, came out. It was meant to be sold to corporations to use within their organizations. And quickly, those or the corporations that purchased Netscape Navigator asked Netscape to make some encryption, and they, they did. They made SSL version 2. And unfortunately for SSL version 2, it was very easily compromised. And by 1995, they already had an update for it of SSL version three um, that, uh, that only recently really got pushed away and said, we should stop using that. So it was, it's been around for quite a long time. And in 1995, there was actually another event that happened. And I, I remember this very clearly because uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting. Uh, Windows came out with a new operating system, Windows 95. And... Uh, as Windows 95 evolved, as did web browsers and the internet, they, of course, started bundling Internet Explorer into all of the operating systems with the intent of pushing Netscape Navigator out of business. And uh, they did a pretty good job because by the late 90s, early 2000s, Microsoft had 95% of market share for web browsers. And that introduces the new topic. So like by 1999, right, there's this browser war game, right? And that's where Microsoft is pushing out, uh, pushing out Netscape and other competitors. And uh, there's actually an antitrust lawsuit about it. But the more important part here in 99 related to encryption is that SSL version 3 needed an update. It needed a revision. And now SSL version 3, uh, they're working with the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, to have a published RFC about encryption for web browsers. And Microsoft, of course, did not want to use the SSL name that came from Netscape for marketing reasons alone. And the next version of SSL that was released was labeled TLS, Transport Layer Security. 
So what's the difference between SSL and TLS? Uh, pretty much nothing. They're just different versions. Uh, it's just a different version number and they changed the name to accommodate Microsoft. That's, that's what the history tells us. Uh, so if somebody's trying to tell you that SSL is used for thing X and TLS is used for thing Y, they're wrong. They're just different versions of the same basic protocol. In modern times, we're using either TLS version 1.2 or 1.3. Uh, we are no longer, we no longer want to use or support TLS version 1.1 or less. We should be removing those from our web servers. Uh, any security audit will tell you that. The only time you should be using that is if you have some legacy gear that absolutely can only use SSL v3 or some version of TLS. So that's the history of SSL and TLS. Let's talk about some data encryption basics so we can start to talk about how this encryption is actually happening with TLS. So whenever we're encrypting communication, uh, our client is going to have some messages that they want to send to the server, but they don't want folks in the public internet to hear about it. So we take that message, we run it through an algorithm along with some unique key, and then that unique key plus the algorithm spits out an encrypted message. We can then send that encrypted message across a public channel where folks on the public channel won't be able to reverse engineer that and decrypt the message. The web server will use the same key and the same algorithm and they can decrypt the message then. So once we decrypt the message, now the server has the same message that the client had. The challenge here though, is how do we get this key that needs to be the same on both sides to be shared by both the client and the server? We don't wanna send that key over the public internet because if we send the key over the internet, that means anybody with the key can decrypt our communication, which defeats the purpose. So how do we securely move that key between one end and the other? So we just looked at data encryption using an algorithm plus a key, but in order for TLS to work correctly, we need some kind of key exchange. So before we start encrypting our data of our websites and our usernames and passwords, things like that, we actually need to exchange a key between our client and our server, and we need to do it in a way that no one else can figure out what that key is. So that's where Diffie-Hellman comes in. So Whit Diffie and Martin Hellman were two really smart mathematicians in the 60s and 70s. They came up with this method of, of uh, being able to transfer a key between two devices without the person in the middle knowing. So here's how that works. So the the server at some point in the negotiation of TLS is going to send a certificate over to the client. And inside of that certificate contains several pieces of information. Uh, two of those pieces of information are two prime numbers, a P value and a G value. Now, I really wanted everybody watching this to really understand what's happening here. So I'm keeping the math very, very simple. In reality, these prime numbers are very, very large. So I'm just using these small ones to make the math simple here so that you can actually do this in your own spreadsheet if you wanted to. So P and G here, we have P of 149, G of 17. This is contained within the certificate. That is our public key information. Everybody in the world can know about it. We don't care. What's going to happen next then is the client is going to choose its own private key. Now, here again, I'm using a small number. I've just chosen eight as my private key. But in the, in the real world, our client is going to choose a 32-byte key that it's going to use as the private key. Then we just need a formula. So now what we do is we take a formula. We take G inside of our certificate. We raise it to the power of A, our private key. And then we mod P it. So we use this modulus function uh, and do mod P, which is in our certificate as well. Now, what, what's the modulus? Uh, let's do a, a quick math lesson. Um, modulus is pretty simple. We, I personally remember learning this in like second or third grade. And uh, the idea here is it's division. We take 95 divided by eight. And to do long division, if you graduated from high school before 2005, you probably learned this long division. 
So here, how many times does eight go into nine? It goes in there once, drop that down. We get one left over, we drop our five down. Eight goes into 15 once, we're left with seven here. Now we can keep doing this process, right? And we can get a bunch more numbers, but that's not what we're interested in here. What we're interested in is the remainder. So 11 remainder seven, the seven here is our modulus. So when we do this calculation, uh, really we're just looking for the remainder of a division problem. So it is pretty simple math here. So we take that, that formula, we plug in our values, we end up with a number five. Now I'm calling that five our encrypted key. It's not really the encrypted key. It's a piece of public information that I can send over to the server that I generated on my client using my private key and say, here you go server, use this for later. Server is gonna do the same process. It's gonna pick a private key. It's going to run it through the formula, G to the power of B this time, because B is my server's private key, mod P. And here this time we end up with 16. 16 is that encrypted key that I'm calling that I can send over to the client. And that is publicly available. Everybody can look at that and see that, and it's not an issue. Now what we do is we run it through this formula once again. We take that encrypted key that we exchanged, we raise it to the power of our private key, mod P. And this is where the nifty math comes in. If we do that, we get 129 on the client side. On the server side, we get 129, meaning that these two keys are now the same. The only way to generate those keys is to use the private key of eight on the client side, private key of six on the server side, and having the P and G values in the, that were transferred in the public key. So that's the only way to get those values. And now we have a shared key for both the client and the server that's never been exchanged. So the client and the server have the same key, and we never sent that key over the public channel. Some really, really cool math here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that key exchange, uh, we have different operations here for TLS version 1.2 versus TLS 1.3. There are different methods to exchange that key. In TLS 1.2, we had three main options. We could use RSA, and RSA uses information inside of the certificate itself, in addition to the PNG values to actually generate the key. However, uh, RSA has been shown that there's potential vulnerabilities and we should avoid using it. Uh, Diffie-Hellman, the one that I just showed you, uh, the implementation of Diffie-Hellman is such that the prime numbers that I talked about, those prime numbers that we're using, uh, there's only a finite set of those. And there's some theories out there that we can use uh, that finite set of numbers to actually reverse engineer keys. So we don't wanna use Diffie-Hellman anymore. And the last one here, elliptical curve DP Hellman, is our final option, uh, which is currently the most secure way we have of exchanging a key inside of our web browsers today. So the protocols that were that are available to us in our browsers, elliptical curve DP Hellman is the preferred method. And as a matter of fact, in version TLS 1.3, elliptical curve DP Hellman is the only method. And there's the, the, we're using this in, in TLS 1.3 to help speed up our handshake process for TLS. And we'll look at that at the end of the presentation during our, our demonstration. So how does this elliptical curve work? Well, the elliptical curve is, is also pretty nifty. It's gonna use some similar principles that we saw in Diffie-Hellman. The difference here is we're gonna take this curve or one of these curve types so there are numerous predefined curve types that we can use here. One of them is the X25519 curve, which is, I've drew an approximation to that curve as this, uh, as the image there. There's some other curve types that we can use as well. And uh, what's gonna happen is in TLS 1.3 using Diffie-Hellman elliptical, elliptical curve, what's gonna happen is our client is actually going to choose a curve type that's common. So here I've chosen the 25519 curve type and the client then is gonna do some calculations. So first the client is going to choose a private key. It's a 32 byte value. And then the client is going to take that curve type that it chose. It's gonna choose an X value on the curve 
It's going to go up and find where the curve intersects that X value. It's going to determine the Y value of that point. And then it's going to multiply the Y value times the private key and generate the public key. So now our client has a private key and a public key. And uh, what will happen now is the client is going to tell the server what it's done. It's going to say, hey, I use this curve type. Here's my public key. Server is going to say, great. It's going to go through the same exact operation that the client just did. It's going to generate a 32-byte private key, multiply it times a point on the curve, generate the public key, and send that over to the client. Now the client and the server have both a public key that was generated by the other side and a private key that, that the device itself generated. And now we can use that to feed it into an algorithm to generate a unique key that both sides can use to encrypt data. Although we're not actually gonna use that key, we're actually gonna use that key to generate some additional keys called application keys, which will then be the keys used to actually do the encryption of the data with another protocol. So that when the client and the server are communicating, it's using a combination of these application keys and an encryption protocol to actually do the encryption of the bulk data. So we're not actually using Diffie-Hellman elliptical curve to encrypt our data. We're just using Diffie-Hellman elliptical curve to generate the key that we're then going to use in our encryption protocol to transfer the data. So we have a key exchange protocol that we use to generate our key to do the data encryption. The protocols we're going to use to do our data encryption, our ciphers here, are either going to be triple DES, AES, or ChaCha20. Triple DES we're not going to use anymore because that's an old antiquated protocol. So we're going to stick with either AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, or ChaCha20. Most browsers are choosing to use AES unless for some reason the server says, no, we're not using AES, and then they'll negotiate to use ChaCha20 instead. So these protocols are actually going to do the bulk encryption of our data. The last component here is handshake integrity. So we need to verify that no one is tampering with our data, with our handshake, while the handshake is happening. If somebody's tampering with that handshake, there's a possibility they could put bogus information in there and actually use that to decrypt messages later on. So when with handshake integrity, we're using some kind of algorithm here, we're using the secure hash algorithm. We can use SHA, SHA-256 or SHA-384. And what these will do is it'll take a snapshot of each message of our handshake, it'll run it through the SHA algorithm, generate a hash, and it'll put that hash inside of the handshake messages. And then the, both the client and the server can validate that the messages sent were actually the ones received. We're also going to use this hash information to generate our keys. So it's a little bit more complex math that, that's not important for this conversation, but just know that we're using these hashes actually in the process of generating our application keys to encrypt our data. There's only one more component here that I haven't talked about, or I've only talked about it briefly, and that is the certificate. Where does the certificate come into play with TLS? Well, the certificate in TLS 1.3 especially is only used to authentic to make sure that the server is who it says it is. So it's verifying the authenticity of our server. So our certificate isn't used for anything else besides that, especially in 1.3. With TLS 1.2, we can use, theoretically, we can use RSA or Diffie-Hellman. And in those cases, we actually need the certificate to do our key exchange. But in TLS 1.3, we've abandoned that. And now we're only doing the, the, the certificate in order to validate the authenticity of it. And once we look at the handshake, we're gonna see why we're not even able to use the certificate anymore to generate our key in TLS 1.3. So let's talk a bit about certificates. Um, certificates, just like I said, it's used to do RSA encryption. Uh, it also contains the P and G values, those prime numbers used for Diffie-Hellman. And 
Again, we're not using that anymore in TLS 1.3. So it's literally just to validate the server is who it says it is through the certificate chained and signed certificates, along with certificate authorities, certificates that are pre-installed on our workstations and in our browsers. So what we've covered so far, key exchange, data encryption, handshake integrity, and server authenticity. These are the main components of our TLS handshake that we're, we're working on to negotiate the session between our client and our server. Next step here, let's go into Wireshark and let's look at both operating systems and Wireshark and find out how we can capture those keys so we can import them into Wireshark to actually decrypt our traffic. Uh, if you have questions, just throw them in the Q&A or in the chat window, and I'd be happy to answer those as they come up. Um, I think this is a part that, uh, this is an important part. I'm going to show you how to do this both in Windows and on my Mac, which is the same as doing it on Linux. So Windows here first, uh, in order to get your session keys captured, um, what we need to do is we need to go into control panel. And in control panel, we're going to go into system. And then in system, we're going to go into advanced system settings and environment variables. And uh, here, uh, I've already have this in here. Let's, let's uh, delete it and I'll re-add it. So we're going to create a new file here. The variable name is all caps SSL key log file. And then the variable value here is going to be a path. So I put this in my documents folder under SSL key log. And uh, oops, let's browse directory and then I'll add that name in later. Documents, SSL key log file. And then we call that SS, SSL. I'll get there. There we go. Hit OK. Hit OK. We can close this then. If we open up a, a file explorer here, we take a look at that folder. I'm actually going to delete anything that's in there. So there's nothing in there right now. If I open up Firefox, it's going to browse to a secure site and it's going to automatically generate that key log file. If I open up Wireshark now and I start a capture, go over to Firefox and we'll go to wireshark.org. Hit stop here. Let's find my Wireshark start here where I start the conversation. Frame contains Wireshark. Here we go. We'll do a follow TCP stream or TLS stream. All right. So right now, uh, we can see that we're using TLS 1.3 here. And I know this is encrypted now because at some point here in the conversation, I just start to see application data, application data. And if I open this up and I look at the TLS information here, it's actually going to tell me, maybe that's too small. Let's zoom in on that. It's actually going to tell me, hey, there's encrypted application data here. So. Now what I can do is I can actually use that SSL key that I exported on my client to figure out what this actually is about. So if I go uh, click on, if I right click on TLS here, go to protocol preferences, transport layer security and open transport layer security. I browse to my SSL key log file here, open that up, hit okay. Uh, it will now decrypt my messages. And now I no longer see application data. Now I actually see messages and we can actually see that uh, we can actually see what's happening here. We can see the certificate being exchanged among other things. So that's how we get our key in Windows. Let's do the same thing on my Mac. So on my Mac, uh, what we need to do is 
open up a command prompt and we're going to do everything from the command prompt here to get our SSL key log file. To do this, we type export SSL key log file equal to, and then we, we give it a name here. So I'm going to just going to drag and drop. I'm going to drag and drop this in here. SSL key log file. And then I will call that SSL key log dot log and hit enter. And now from the same exact terminal window, right? We can't open a new terminal window and you can't uh, open Firefox with by clicking on it. Close the tabs here. We have to open it here. So we say open dash A Firefox. And now we'll open up Firefox and that is going to populate my SSL key log file. So if we open up our key log file here, we now have a, a key log. I start up Wireshark and I do a capture here. On my wireless interface, there it is. And I go to HTTPS wireshark.org. We'll download the website. We'll stop my capture. Let's do frame contains Wireshark. Do a follow TCP stream on this. Now this is, I, it looks like I already have that file loaded into Wireshark here. Uh, we can verify that by going into open transport layer security preferences. And uh, I can actually remove this. And when I remove this, it should encrypt my messages. So where it says change cipher spec finished here, that should change to change cipher spec and then application data. So if I hit okay here, it's exactly what happened. Change cipher spec application data. So that is how I capture my session key on a Mac or a Linux box to get it into Wireshark. So now let's, let's take a look at uh, a couple more things here. What I wanna do is look at the difference between the TLS 1.2 handshake and the TLS 1.3 handshake. So it's a little hard to get servers that are natively doing TLS 1.2. So let's uh, let's go into my files here, where I have uh, captured. I've already captured a website. Continue without saving. So I've captured the a, a website a couple of years ago from Pluralsight. And I've done it in TLS 1.2. And right now, we should be able to see that this is encrypted. And we can see that with the application data here. And let's take a look at how far along in the handshake we can go before we see encrypted data. Give me just a minute here. So in TLS 1.2, the client is going to send a hello message. And in that hello message, it's going to tell the server, it's going to say, hey, server, uh, I support all of these different cipher suites. So there's 14 different cipher suites that the client supported when I captured this. And we have all different options, elliptical curve, Diffie-Hellman uh, with AES and SHA-256, right? Those are the key exchange the encryption protocol and the hash algorithm. All the way down here with, we can use RSA with AES and SHA. So it's gonna send it, the server a list of what it can support. The server is then gonna send a hello message back to the client. It's gonna say, hey, I've picked this Cypher suite. We're gonna use elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman with AES-128 encryption and SHA-256 for the hash algorithm. The server then sends the certificate and then it sends its key exchange information, right? So the certificate is sent. That's gonna have the P and G value in it. 
And then the server is actually going to send its own public key information along with the certificate so that the client can do the calculations for the key. And then the server says, okay, my hello is done. The client is then going to do the same thing. It's going to do that calculation I showed you earlier where it generates that public encrypted key. Then it's going to send that over to the server. And then the server is going to then uh, recognize that. And at that point, the client can start to encrypt messages. And then the server is going to send a message saying change cipher spec and start encrypting messages as well. So we're pretty far along in the process before we actually start encrypting data, right? After this, we have uh, application data and we can see that this is encrypted application data that we can't see. So let's now decrypt this traffic and take a look at what we see. So when we decrypt this traffic, let's grab my decryption key here. Let me find out where I put this. <laughs> uh, Sharkfest 2021. There we go. Open up that key. It's going to decrypt our traffic. Now, when we see the client key exchange, change cipher spec finished, now we can actually see that it's finished. We can see that it's finished here. And then we can see our get command that's sent in HTTP. This was old school before uh, we're using HTTP2. So HTTP 1.1 here, we can actually see that we're trying to get Pluralsight's website. So the rest of our messages are decrypted. So the, my point here is, is that this is a pretty lengthy process to do the handshake and we're not actually encrypting messages until that very last message that says finished. Now let's take a look at a TLS 1.3 conversation. We're gonna open up uh, a packet capture that I did last year to wireshark.org. And let's take a look at this. So when we do TLS 1.3, our client hello message is a lot different. So our client hello message is gonna give the option to revert back to a previous version. All right, so we're still going to send, we're still going to send the different cipher suites that we support. All right, but part of those cipher suites that we send here it just says TLS AES 128 with SHA 256. Well, what that's saying is there's no key exchange listed there. And that means we're using TLS 1.3. If you notice here, it says version 1.2 we're using though. Well, that's kind of, that's just false information used to trick uh, devices that do a legitimate man in the middle attack to inspect encrypted messages when leaving a corporate network. So we're tricking these, uh, these middleware boxes by saying the version's 1.2, even though it's version 1.3. So how do we know this? Well, if we look at the key share information, this is information that is not in this is information that's not in TLS 1.2 handshakes. So here our client hello is saying, hey, if we're going to use 1.3, great. Here is my curve type, X25519. And here is the key that I generated from that. That is my private key multiplied by a point on the X25519 curve. And we even give the server an option to use a different curve type here using the SECP 256 R1 curve as well. We do the same thing. We have the key exchange information for that that was calculated. The nifty part here is that we're already sending key exchange information in our client hello message, which means that when the server responds, the server can respond and say, oh, okay, yeah, I see you. Uh, we're going to use uh, TLS Encryption AES is going to be our encryption protocol with SHA-256 for the handshake. Uh, here's the key share. It's saying the server chose X25519. And here's the server's public key information. Now we can hit the change cipher spec, which is just bogus used for backwards compatibility with TLS 1.2. And now we are encrypting data. So here's a message from the server that is purely encrypted. And this is still part of a handshake. 
So what do you suppose is included in that information? Let's, let's go find out. So we'll get the encryption key here. Uh, SSL key log is the decryption keys. So we'll put that in. So now, right after the server says, hello, we're using X25519 with AES encryption. Now the server sends its certificate and some other information that says, I'm all done. So we're, the process is a lot shorter here where the client says, hello, the server says, hello, yep, we're already encrypted. Here's my certificate. You can validate that I am who I say I am. And the server is sent encrypted now. So we couldn't do that in TLS 1.2 because if we happen to choose Diffie-Hellman or RSA to do our key exchange, we needed information in that certificate in order to generate the key to do the encryption. Here, we're actually able to encrypt that certificate with which which offers some protection against a man in the middle attack where we're not sending the certificate unencrypted. So now we're actually sending that encryption, that certificate encrypted. The client then responds and says, okay, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to use this as well. And it starts encrypting data. And then we can start sending the website. So that is how uh, we do web browser encryption using TLS. Uh, I hope you got a lot of value out of this uh, and uh, are able to actually visualize what's happening. I know for me, I'm not unknowledgeable with, with understanding how encryption might happen. The challenge for me was just having a simple way to decrypt the, or simple way to understand how the encryption was working. There's a lot of jargon in terminology when we're looking at it. So to, to undo the jargon, that's where engineers oftentimes get really tripped up is, is how to make the jargon accessible to everybody. So my intention here was to give you some visualization so that when you're trying to do some decryption of traffic in Wireshark or understand the process of what's happening when traffic is encrypted, uh, that you have some mental images to use to help you sort that out so that you're not trying to figure out a bunch of jargon. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I can make the slides available for you. That's no problem. Uh, as far as the latency difference between 1.2 and 1.3, uh, the, the, uh, the big latency difference here is that how long that handshake, how long the handshake is happening. Uh, so from a from that standpoint of how long the handshake, there's only a couple messages, right? There, when we're doing a TLS 1.3 handshake, we have a hello from the client, a hello from the server. The server sends a certificate. The client sends a message saying we're done. And that's it. When we're doing TLS 1.2, When we're doing TLS 1.2, we have client says hello, server says hello. Server sends the certificates. Server sends key exchange information. Client sends the key exchange, exchange information back. Then the server sends a message back saying, okay, I'm done. And then the client sends a message back saying, okay, I'm done. Right? So the, the messages are a lot longer here. There's a lot more, there's a lot more pieces to the puzzle for uh, TLS 1.2, the 1.3. So the handshake is actually happening substantially faster. When you have a server doing millions of these calculations, you're going to save lots and lots of time on that. Uh, next one here was, how does this change with the man in the middle box? Uh, nothing changes with the man in the middle box using TLS 1.3. It can grab the same information and, uh, and fill out the information. Uh, I'm not sure, I haven't looked at the man in the middle boxes for a while, if they can support TLS 1.3 natively yet, but I believe what was happening was it was doing TLS 1.3 from the man in the middle box to the server, and then doing TLS 1.2 from the client to the man in the middle box, so that in a corporate network, you could you know, do your um, data loss prevention stuff.
Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to, uh, Samantha, uh, Baldwin asked no grease for TLS 1.3. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Uh, so Kim, uh, can you do a capture now from surfing to wireshark.org or any other secure site to see the difference? Uh, sure. I mean, once you have, once you launch and, and, once you capture your session keys, that's going to work for anything that you browse to in your browser. So it's going to capture the session keys for any website that you go to. I just picked Wireshark.org because it was uh, it was an easy one. But there's nothing special about Wireshark.org that lets me see the keys. Uh, you can see that with any of the websites. Can you do this when you're capturing on a server? Uh, the server side is going to be a different process to, to capture your keys. Uh, oftentimes, if you're just doing testing on a server, you may want to revert back to like RSA and TLS 1.2 to, to, so that you can use the RSA key itself to do that uh, capture. Uh, but uh, there, there's likely a method to get your session keys on the server side. I just don't have that methodology. Uh, Keith is asking a question here. If I have a network capture someone else sends me that has all the handshaking and I open that file, will it decrypt with the SSL key log? If the user who captured that file sends you the key log file along with it, yes. Otherwise, no. Um, if you don't have that key log file from the moment that it was captured, you're not going to be able to get the keys for that. Uh, Sheree is asking a question, SSL key log from Chrome. Uh, I launched Firefox. This will work the same way with Chrome. So you can, you can actually do this with Chrome as well, just like I did with Firefox, no difference. Uh, other browsers may or may not work. Uh, I believe uh, Microsoft Edge does generate the files. Uh, Macintosh's Safari does not. Can I just interject there, Ross? Yes, yes. because... Um... Windows provides its own um, crypto routines called S channel, and you can't get the key log out of S channel. So if the application um, or the browser uses S channel for its TLS, you cannot get the keys for it. Um, now Edge being Chromium is a bit halfway in between um, these yep. days. So I think the last, the last time I did this, I watched somebody capture it capture the session keys using edge um and i've also seen it not work <laughs> so i think i think you're you're um I, I, that makes a lot of sense yeah and, and especially app, other applications um that use s channel because that's what is available on the platform so generally the key log um only works if the application is using open ssl uh libraries Yes, thank you. Um, all right, so does the key change after some time? Uh, I believe it does. Um, however, I don't have uh, the I don't have the data on that. So, okay, and then we have another question here asking to show the key generation method. Um, uh, Harshal, could you please uh, explain what you want there or what you're asking for there? Um, are you looking for the presentation or do you want me to show you how to capture the keys? And then I have another question here from Eric asking, can you go back and cover generating a key on Windows under environment variables? And that is a yes, that is no problem. Sure, Herschel, do you want that in Windows or Mac or both? I'm going to show the Windows one right now. OK. So in Windows, uh, we go to Control Panel. We go to System. In System, we go to Advanced System Settings. We click on Environment Variables. And in Environment Variables, uh, up in the user variables, you're going to uh, select new. You're going to put in 
all caps SSL key log file. And then for the va variable value here, this is a user choice. You can put this anywhere you want, right? So I typically just browse to my documents directory and I put it in my documents and I create a SSL key log directory. Oops. And then at the end of that, you have to specify the exact file name that you want it to be stored as. And I typically call that SSL key log dot log. It doesn't matter what you call that. You can just call it uh, SSL log dot log. It, it really doesn't matter. You can call it SSL log dot text. The, the, the name here is unimportant. Uh, it's just a matter of remembering what you called it so that you can later um, find that document and put it into uh into your um wireshark does that help uh peter and herschel i just posted the link there to the wireshark tls wiki page which has some instructions there as well outstanding yeah this is all available on online as too and that it is definitely in there um Yes, Jackie, for the DLP stuff, right? DLP is a, a man in the middle attack, basically, but it's a legitimate man in the middle attack. And when, when you have a DLP box, uh, what it's doing is it's tricking, the, uh, it's tricking the client into thinking that it's talking to the distant server, like wireshark.org, except it's not actually talking to wireshark.org. You're actually making a TLS communication between your client and the DLP device, the data loss prevention device. So you build a session between those two devices and then the DLP device builds a second session between itself and the web server you're trying to reach like wireshark.org. And then in the, the middle there between on that server, on that DLP server, there's a place where the traffic is completely unencrypted. In order to make that work correctly, you need uh, you need to have a certificate authority in the enterprise organization that can install certificates on the end user devices to trick them into thinking that they're going to the actual Wireshark.org server and when they're really not. So that hopefully that answered your question. If you want something more about that, Jackie, um, I'd be I'd be happy to to say a little bit more. Sometimes see that done by AV endpoint stuff that it will um, install a certificate locally, yep. um, trusted certificate, and it will act as the proxy, a man in the middle um, to check stuff going out. Right. How often are the keys changed daily, weekly? Um, those keys are unique to every single session. Um, there is an option in TLS 1.3 to do session resumption. Uh, I've I've uh, about a year ago or more, I did a, a bunch of captures to try to, to capture this in the, in the wild. And um, I was, I was unsuccessful, but that's only because I, I gave up after probably a couple hours of, of trying. Oh, okay. And then Jack is saying, yeah, our DLP is not based on a separate server. Yeah. Graham, thanks. Thanks for that input. Um, I appreciate that. Otherwise, I think that that wraps up, wraps this up. Uh, did I get everybody's question? Uh, slides, people want some the slides and that's no problem. I can get that to you. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for, for showing up and participating.